Welcome to today's full wedding day. Today we're answering a simple question. Is the Nikon Z5 good enough to photograph a wedding, uh, a real life wedding, and also one at a more challenging venue? A lot of the venues that I shoot are very easy, very good lighting, very soft lighting, big windows. Today, we're going to find ourselves in a much more challenging environment, very beautiful, but very challenging, pocketed light, mixed light, difficult situations, and you really do have to push the files at this venue a lot further than you would normally have to push them really at any other venue that I've ever photographed in my career. If you are new here, I am Taylor Jackson. I photograph 60 plus weddings every single year on a normal year. This year is a little bit different. And if you're interested in watching more of these behind the scenes videos, there are a number of them, 30 plus already over on my channel. And they're there for, for you to check out. The, my main motivation behind it was when I was first getting into weddings, I sent out probably about hundred emails to local photographers and no one would let me second shoot a wedding for them. So I kind of thought it would be nice whenever I get to the point that I'm photographing a lot of weddings that I could bring that second shooting experience to YouTube to hopefully help out other people similar to myself that wanted to get into the industry but really just couldn't find the the first rung on the ladder that no one was willing to help me out so if you like this video feel free to give it give it a like or subscribe or send it to a friend or post it somewhere i don't know well, let's just let's just go to let's go to the photos don't trust what you heard from the bubble dog i've been busting out features on a double tree shuttle the facetimes asked me how brother stay so humble well, I just said to ask the driver for some help with a buckle. But anyway, backtrack, I've been doing concerts in the mirror. And I got fam who only get the updates in the earphones and keep on thinking this here could make a full-time career. Maybe it won't, but I'll be up in your turf with the faux fur all year, bro. And I said, ooh, I'ma get a half of the town and a move. We be doing that doesn't count on All right, moving into the first look now, and uh, every location is amazing. It's cloudy, it's the perfect amount of cloudy. It's not too dark that there's gonna be a lot of dark circles under here. It's a little little highlight coming through the clouds, and it's just kind of perfect weather right now. If it was a really sunny day, we would be using this little uh, covered space over here because the sun is still really high, so you wanna get that shade for the first look. So whenever somebody turns around, they're not just turning around directly into a bright piece of sun that ruins your photo, and it's a more relaxed and easy experience, I think, for the couple as well. And then one other thing, it makes sense to always put people near the edge, so you want them in the shade, but you, you don't want them all the way back here in the forest where it actually starts to get legitimately dark. It's fine, but your light is gonna be a lot better if you are closer to the edge. That goes for forest, and also you're not gonna get that green cast that comes off of being in a forest if you're closer to the exit of the forest. In 2010, thought I was doing something. And now I'm rapping with a crew or something. I guess the track don't really stick unless he's gluing something. And I never fit the shoe until I do or something. Yo, bracing myself like teeth, boy, it's the same old route on some new concrete. But homie, these tunes make you get a new ID. I'm trying to do my thing, but the commute ain't cheap. I'm on a two day week for all this rap these days. And we can still pitch the track to all the wack DJs. We're singing happy days, wearing tacky J's. And I'm just pumped that I made it out my nappy phase. Let's go. We can turn the whole world around. I'm in the backseat, really trying to hold it down. And if you from the lost and found and get your hands up high and your shoulders down and sit and we can turn the whole world around i'm in the back seat really trying to hold it down and if you up now from the lost and found and put your hands up high and your shoulders down and sit so there are a lot of things that I absolutely love about the Z series. I love the colors, I love the lenses and the way that it puts images together for my work as a wedding photographer. It really does bring it to the next level just through the tonality and, and the way that the final images come together. It's just something that no other camera brand has really matched. That said, one of the negatives is definitely the autofocus still. There have been significant improvements since the Z6 originally came out and I'm hoping that whenever they do nail it that it's easy enough to just put out a firmware update to update the Z5 and the original Z6 and the Z7 because after shooting with the Canon R for quite some time the Canon R just really makes the correct decisions in pretty much every environment you never have to override what the camera automatically wants to do and if you do decide to override it's pretty easy on the Canon R system on the Nikon side of things it makes incorrect decisions in autofocus and 
it's very difficult to override those situations and especially when you're at a, a once in a lifetime moment like a wedding day if it decides that it wants to focus on this hedge instead of the the clearly obvious people that are in the scene and you just can't snap the autofocus out of that that is a big problem for me and pretty much the only problem I would say with with this camera and with the Z series system overall when it comes to weddings if you're photographing models or just people one at a time out in very simple environments you'll experience no issues at all the autofocus is, is very good for that it just starts to struggle when you put it into complex environments like a wedding day disturbing the peace with some peace of mind sleeping in jeans i'ma need a night od on a cheap device oc on a cheapest flight lately i've been on the move trying to get to something but i told her i've been running just to see the sights see the lights and they're not my types so we chill with the brother if it's ice all white but it's not am i living life in a box tell if it's a crisis or not i hate coming off too normal but i can use a wife and a dog and a job and a white fence off where the white kids walk well the vibe been lost don't know where the days went i spent a lot of nights in a blur and i bet it's been a few too many trying to make it and i i haven't yet yeah we had to bet I'm only here, yeah. you know. But if you don't like this music, then don't be listening to it. You know, I'm just a dude that you know, or something similar. If you don't keep it real, can you go somewhere but here? Cause you know, we're only losing control. Yeah. Uh, I say, if you don't like this music, you don't be listening to it. You know, I'm just a dude that you know, or something similar. If you don't keep it real, can you go somewhere but here, cause you know we're only losing control just for a minute. Oh. One thing that Nikon did, in my opinion, very wrong with this camera is named it an entry-level mirrorless camera. I do not believe this camera to be entry-level, but I do see how it could potentially be competing with future products that maybe they haven't released yet. So if you did notice that on their website or in the marketing material and it kind of turned you off of this camera, uh, just know that that's not really the full truth, that while it is priced at a very low price point, and I guess maybe that's something to keep in mind when I do compare this to the R6 and the, the Canon R system, that is a much more expensive system than the Nikon Z series. It's also a lot larger. One of the huge benefits with Nikon Z series is that they actually make great 1.8 glass that you can use in a professional setting all of the time. So your bag weighs a heck of a lot less when you come to a wedding day. And you can also afford all of the primes that you want because they're all reasonable prices for a professional grade prime. Even if it is a 1.8, don't be too put off by that. I'm in a bush. Because I'm the second shooter today, I'm not going to set up an off-camera flash. I feel like if there's multiple off-camera flashes going off, it's a little obtrusive. If you are interested in everything that I know about off-camera flash for wedding photographers, there is actually a course over on my members website. If you sign up to be a member, you get access to that as well as $2,000 plus of all of my other courses. So maybe head over there if you're interested in off-camera flash or introvert's guide to posing. It also includes all my presets that you've been seeing in this video, as well as my micro weddings course, which came out last month, and the elopements course, which came out the month before. So because I will not be setting up an off-camera flash, I'm going to run this ISO pretty high actually because I, this is an f2.8 zoom lens. If you are interested in the, the Z series, I would definitely say to pick up the 35 and the 85 1.8 primes. They're both phenomenal lenses and in a situation like this, it really will save you and help you keep your ISO down, especially on a camera like this that the ISO gets a little bit sketchy. I'll also mention that the JPEGs that it actually produces are even more sketchy than the RAW files. The RAW files are actually pretty good, but if you're looking at the JPEGs on the back of the screen, they're actually really, really grainy. Not sure what kind of happens there, but just something I've noticed. And also my friend over at BJ Photo in Waterloo has also noticed. So a few things to think about, and now we go into the reception. She said I'm a triple, honey, welcome to Trivago. Tell me who you know, who is it tripping for a follow? But all in the air like Showtime and the Apollo. Puffing up your chest, the next thing you know is hollow, but well, hello. I've been swinging like some jello. You got one in the fun guy, he gets some portobello. So I guess I need some grease up on my elbow. Yeah. But now my light turned yellow. And I've been looking for a cheat code. Life don't come in a neat bowl. Bringing the receipt home, but we know, we know that. Keep your head up and your seat pull back. Ah, how do people see you that can burden a man? 22 years on a personal brand. Ah, no. Ah, no. Yeah. I told you, how do people see you that 
like a burden of man. 22 years on a personal brand. Ah, yeah. Ah, how do people see you like a burden of man? 22 years on a personal brand. Oh. Moving into the last shot of the wedding. One thing that I will again stress is if you are interested in going with something like the Z5, definitely invest in the prime lenses. The 1.8s really will make your life in there a heck of a lot better. Last event of the night coming up, which is the sparkler send off. It's a little, a little misty and weird out here. So we're gonna do it underneath uh, the, the awning here with these Edison bulbs in the background. If you ever can have ambient light for a sparkler send off, it is definitely recommended. I would honestly recommend doing them during blue hour if possible. The downside with that is that it usually doesn't align with any sort of send off. The couple in a normal year really isn't leaving during blue hour, but if they wanna do sparkler photos, they are a heck of a lot better during blue hour rather than when everything's dark. But if you have some ambient in the background to give the scene some three dimensionality, it's a lot better of a photo. Do, it, do an outro. <laughs> outro. Well, thank you so much for joining Taylor and I today on this wedding day of Justine and Alex at the beautiful Hacienda Saria. Robin here is lighting some candles for the sparkler send off. And I'm about to uh, exit the stage left. It's now been a few days since the wedding and I thought that I would bring together some sort of conclusion for you and my thoughts uh, to give you the I used to walk uphill both ways in the snow to wedding story. When I first got into weddings, I couldn't really shoot above, I would say 800 ISO I was, I was comfortable with, so you needed that 1.4 prime. And getting up to 1600 ISO, grain would really just start to take over the image and it had to be an image pretty much that you would deliver in black and white. Being able to go up to 10,000 ISO, we should really have absolutely no complaints. It kind of goes back to the whole just having the right tools and having one of the right tools is a fast prime to work in an environment when things get a little bit dark. So to recap my thoughts on this camera, they definitely 100% named it incorrectly, or at least in my opinion, uh, for calling it an entry level camera. It really kind of just limited the market and no one, at least on, even on YouTube, you can see this, that no one really takes this camera seriously. Well, as you've seen in this video, it is a very serious camera for wedding photography and um, weddings are kind of a subsection of all other styles of photography. So by watching this video, hopefully you understand how good it is in just a variety of situations. The autofocus is a challenge. You can override it by, by touching the screen, but I find that it's just, when I'm in the viewfinder, at least when I've been using the Canon R6, if uh, you probably actually saw this in the video of me doing some weird camera moves, basically my strategy is if there's multiple people in the scene and it face detects on the wrong person, I just 
frame them out of the scene and it gets on that person and then it stays on that person when I focus recompose. So it's rather than like a holding focus and recomposing, it's just like a really quick, just little, little move. And it seems to work really, really well. And it's pretty much hundred percent accurate. When I try that strategy with the, with the Z5 and even the Z6 or Z7, it just doesn't quite read my mind in that way. I don't know if that's my fault, if I'm just asking too much of the camera or if that's something that's hopefully going to be improved in the future. As I mentioned, if you are just out there photographing a couple or photographing two people and you're using face and eye detect, it'll do a great job. It's just when it gets into the more challenging environments that it starts to kind of freak out a little bit, unfortunately. By shooting at 2.8 on the, the lens that I use, this is this is now the Canon R6, the, the front screen though there is a little tiny mirror I'll do a video in a few days that there's a mirror that you can put on top that shows you the back of the flip screen so if you want to self film with a Z5 it's possible it's not the most ideal solution but it does actually work which is pretty cool uh, I shot the entire day at 2.8 uh, or some at 3.2 I think uh, accidentally but at 2.8 you have more room for error I guess in focus that if it's selecting the wrong person and I'm at 24 millimeters at f 2.8 my infinity focus point is like right there. So anyone beyond that is going to be reasonably in focus or completely in focus. But if you were shooting with something like the 85 prime or the 50 or the, even the 35 and it got the focus point wrong, that would become a bit of a problem. So if you're seeing that you like that, this kind of worked out okay for me, know that it's because I was shooting at 2.8 most of the day of all of the situations that I put it in today. I would say that it did great in 90% of them. And there's kind of that 10% margin for, for improvement still, um, to rank it against something like the Canon R6, uh, I'm not mentioning Sony specifically because I don't have a whole lot of experience shooting their products, but to speak to something like the Canon R6, which I would probably put on par with Sony, um, judging from both my experience as well as a lot of my friends that have used it. So judging from that, which I would say is kind of industry standard, Nikon definitely still falls below that. Um, to timestamp this, because I think it's important, this is before, this is a few days before the, the announcement or release, I'm not sure what, what it is, uh, of the Z6 II, which we really don't know officially what it is yet. There's lots of rumors out there, but we'll, I guess we'll all find out together what that camera looks like. And then the other rumor that's been floating around for a long time is that there will be a professional level product coming out at some point early next year. So I'm really hoping by that point, that the autofocus is up to the point of, of the Canon R6 and, and Sony, or at least close enough for me to comfortably say that like, hey, they're all at least in the same ballpark right now. Because as of right now, unfortunately, they are not. Uh, I used to shoot all of my Nikon digital SLRs in single point mode. So I would drag that point around with my thumb and make sure that it's on, on the face that I want to focus on. After going to the Canon R6, I realized that that's not really necessary. And that was necessary in digital SLR because I just really didn't trust it. And you didn't see the image that you were taking through the electronic viewfinder, the optical viewfinder. So I had to control that camera a little bit more. When moving to something like the Canon R6, I am able to actually see everything that I'm doing and I can see that it's in focus and I can see where the autofocus points are landing, which are a heck of a lot more tiny and you can, they just kind of like cascade over the subject that you, you would expect. Whereas Nikon and with the, the Z5, and while they track, they don't track as well. Another thing I'll mention when it comes to autofocus is that the eye and face detect I don't know if it's intentional, but it seems to take a little while before it actually kicks in. People are a lot closer than I would expect it to at least be able to ID that like, hey, there's one person in the frame. I'd love to focus on them. It'll give you the, the red squares rather than the, the yellow box over their face. I will say with Canon and Sony that it will it will spot people from way further away than you could ever expect and, and make sure that you know that that's the subject. The big thing for me, it comes down to trust and trust in my equipment and to know that what I want it to do at any moment, uh, that that camera will be able to do it. I would say that this camera is 80, Five, I, I'm gonna give it a 90% of the way there. So you can definitely use it, you can definitely get by. The high ISO is surprisingly good and I think the big comparison has been between the, the non-backlit sensor of the Z5 versus the Z6, which has the backlit illuminated sensor, which should be better in high ISO. Uh, on a wedding day, I don't really, I'm not gonna get, even with a 2.8 lens, I'm not really gonna get above 10,000 ISO, I don't think, and if I do, I definitely have the tools to kind of override that and to put on that prime to get my ISO down a little bit and shoot at 1.8 or bring in some off-camera lighting. I didn't use any flash at all in this uh, in this video. The one situation that it, it kind of got to borderline usable for me, or at least I would have had to run noise reduction on it, was during the cake cut, but they are facing into a wall that is reflecting pretty much no light at them, and I'm just kind of hunkered in the corner here, uh, photographing kind of up on them and we're trying to recover some of those shadows, but still trying to keep the highlights from behind them. So it was a challenging scene, and I would say that the Z5 did really, really well. You can just put a flash and you can bounce a 
flash off that wall. And then all of a sudden that photo, you don't even need to go anywhere near 10,000 ISO to capture it. Uh, if you are interested, we actually filmed a bunch of the off camera flash for wedding photographers course at this venue, because again, it's a pretty challenging venue. Uh, so if you're part of the members site, you can, you can just go and watch that right now and how I troubleshoot situations with off camera lighting. It's a little bit less uh, than what you'd expect. I don't have any modifiers. I just really rely heavily on bouncing off of different objects in the room. Uh, there's a, a, an imperfect science to it, but it is how I use off camera flash all of the time at a wedding day to be a little bit less obtrusive. So know that there is a limit to this camera, but that limit is pretty reasonable at kind of like a 10,000 ISO that that's my, my comfort level as long as I know that I'm at least not wildly underexposing the image. Uh, and then also knowing that the JPEGs that I'm seeing and the JPEGs that it's giving you on your, on your computer really aren't the best. I don't know what happened here. I, uh, Abdullah over at BJ Photo here in Waterloo, if you're looking for a place to buy your cameras, uh, head over to BJ Photo Waterloo. Uh, he kind of mentioned that like the JPEGs, however they cook those out, just isn't really as great as any other camera that, that Nikon's produced in a while. So know that that's a thing and that you have to go to the raw files of this, that in a high ISO environment, I would not be relying on those JPEGs. I normally wouldn't, but I really especially wouldn't on the Nikon Z5. The huge thing for me is that this camera has two card slots, which is something that makes me so much more comfortable on a wedding day. Uh, I would, I was very hesitant. I actually didn't ever shoot the Nikon Z6 as a main camera body because it just has one card. Very reliable, it's an XQD card. Likelihood of anything going wrong is, is so minimal, but to have two card slots on a wedding day, I think is just important for me. And I know back when, when I got into weddings that everything was one card slot and we got through, And it, but now there's technology that has two, so why not have that? Uh, peace of mind to release a little bit of anxiety. Um, card failures, in, I guess, are more common in SD cards. I would quickly say that the only cards that I've ever had fail are SD Lexar cards. Um, I've had no issues with their XQDs. I've had lots of issues with their SD cards. So uh, I use SanDisk now because of that. And I've been super happy with them. So make sure you get some, some good cards, some maybe new cards at the beginning of every wedding season and make sure you keep them in good repair and you, and you actually take care of them. And I don't suspect that you'll have any problems. If you're a hybrid shooter, um, this camera is great. But the downside is with Nikon and also with Canon is that they only shoot video files to one single card. So in this case, you're now shooting all of your video content on one camera body to one single card. So it'll back up the raw files or it'll do raw on one card and JPEGs on the other. But the video files will only go to one card, which is a bit of a bummer. I would love to have that backed up somehow. I don't know if that's possible, but that would be a future thing that if the Z6 II or the, the whatever the pro mirrorless is that's rumored. Uh, I would love to see that in that body. That would make my life as a hybrid shooter a heck of a lot better. Um, I will also maybe do a quick comparison. R6 sucks for hybrid because you, you basically, um, so there is a very nice little, little record button on there, but if you hit the record button when you're in manual photography mode, it just launches auto video settings and you can't fix that and you can't map your video settings to C3, which is where it's pulling those settings from. Um, so pretty much, Terrible camera for hybrid, unfortunately. You can make it work, you can, you can always make any camera work, but it's not the most ideal solution. The Z5, so easy with the little flip between photo and video mode, and it's just very intuitive if you're doing both photography and video coverage at something like a wedding day, uh, which we do pretty often on a normal year. This year obviously has been a little bit different. That is all that I really have to say about this camera. It is a fantastic camera. It is by no means an entry level camera. So if you've read that, don't, don't, internalize that, just be like, hey, this is what the camera does. These are the specs. That sounds like what I need. I don't need to do 4K 60 video. And just be happy with this camera because ergonomically it's amazing. I would far prefer to use this body and this lens system specifically um, on a full wedding day because of just the, the form factor and also just the general smallness of it. So you can put everything in a, in a much smaller bag. Um, maybe one last thing to speak to here. The way that Nikon designs their lenses is definitely different from the way that any other brand manufactures their lenses. Even with this 24 to 70 2.8 uh, zoom lens, every image, there's the, the tonality and the, the character to the image, they really pay attention to that. They design something that is optically great, but also brings in those artistic elements. I find that shooting Sony specifically is very clinical. It's uh, it's like, it's yes, that's a technically correct frame, but I don't feel like there's a whole lot of art to it. I feel like that's the same with Canon, the R6, the R5. But when it comes to Nikon, I feel like their lenses all bring in different elements to really make maybe 10% of your images really stand out and become something that 
you could not have shot on another um, camera brand. So maybe something to think about. I do appreciate that. And I do want to see the success of the Z series simply because of that. And I'm very interested in checking out the 51.2 because the sample images that they released weren't really the, the ones that I wanted to see. Uh, I think that that lens is going to be a lot better than what they're currently amping it up to be. So I'm excited for that, even though that gets back big and, and expensive. Uh, you can get away with the 1.8 primes, no problem. They're all fantastic. I have a review, I think, for pretty much everything in the Nikon Z series up on my channel right now, uh, with the exception of the 7200, which I don't have yet and I haven't shot, and the 20 prime, uh, the 24 prime, 35 prime, uh, the kit lens, the, the zoom lens that you saw today, the 85 and the super wide, the F4 version. 14 to 24 F 2.8 isn't out yet, but I am going to actually be picking that up. I was hesitant in the beginning, but after watching what the lens that you saw today was capable of, I would love to see how that tech goes into a wider angle lens. I feel like it will create images that, that I would not be able to create otherwise. Uh, and then I'll maybe experiment with a little, little mirror thing that goes on top of my camera to give myself a front screen and try to film some stuff and we'll see if it works. Thanks for watching today. If you have any questions about this camera, drop them in the comments below. If I see them, I always do my best to get back to you and or at least point you in the direction of somebody that might have the answer. Uh, don't forget to subscribe and like this video and head on over to the member site if you're interested in the off-camera flash lighting course, which takes you back to this venue and shows you my entire process for off-camera flash lighting in a difficult environment like a wedding day. That is all, and I will see you next time for a video where we decide to shoot a camera and try to get a thousand megapixel image which I don't recommend, but we did it.